Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Art Forum. If you haven't met me before, I'm David Sequera. I'm the director of the Margaret Lawrence Gallery here at the Victorian College of the Arts. And I'm also the person that has the privilege of putting together the Art Forum program uh, for the university. And before we begin, I'd like you to join me in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered, the people of the Bunurung and Wurundjeri uh, of the Greater Kulin Nation, and to consider that for generations before the VCA was thought of, or the University of Melbourne was thought of, that, that um, the traditional custodians practiced song, dance, painting, they shared stories, and that ri these rituals continue today. And it is a real pleasure uh, that I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Turn now to our guest speaker. Since the 1980s, Lindy Lee has created paintings, works on paper and sculpture that draw on her Australian and Chinese heritage to articulate the experience of living between two cultures. Her works, which explore the complexities associated with the history of art, the issues of cultural authenticity and personal identity, are intimately linked with her interests in Taoism and Zen Buddhism. Lindy's practice incorporates a range of symbolic gestures and processes that embody the interco interconnectedness of human experience, nature, and the cosmos. Recent projects include the major 2020 to 2021 survey exhibition, Lindy Lee, Moon in a Dewdrop at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. Wherever you are, please make Lindy welcome. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, this is actually my first full Zoom presentation, although, you know, what a time we live in. Um, first of all, I'm just going to start with a, a, a just a very brief overview because my career now is, is pretty much four decades long. So I don't know how that happened, but I've done a lot of work in my life. To simplify matters, I just want to carve up my process, my progress into three, three um three distinct times. Um, the first one deals with post-modernity and the copy. The second one deals with identity and family. And the third is the intimacy of our relationship with cosmos or universe and nature. Um, and that's, it's been quite a con pr privilege to, um, you know, to have the MCA show because you know, you get to look behind you and see, well, you know, no matter how complicated life might have been, there's always been some kind of path uh, to have followed, which is kind of gratifying. So when I came back to Australia, well, I, I studied in, in the UK uh, in at Chelsea School of Art in the late 70s, but I couldn't sort of settle and, and life was very expensive and I found myself having to come back to Australia, which was probably the best thing for me to do because it's only in that place of my greatest discomfort, shall we say, that I could actually enter uh, the content that my work needed to do, to go to. So in the 1980s, a lot was written about my work in terms of post-modernity and um, all that sort of stuff. I'm not gonna talk about that. All I'm gonna talk about is, is that, and I'm sure so many of you have this experience, and that is you walk into your studio and you struggle so hard to, to to find your own time and space to make your work. But then that ugly question arises, what the hell do I make my work about? So when I came back to Australia, I felt stuck. It felt like everything in everything that was possible in art had already been done. So where do you go from there? So my strategy was quite simple. I just went to the library and I just searched through all the books and all the images and I just chose things that I absolutely fell in love with especially in my travels in Italy to Italy uh, in the 70s so I lived in Italy for about a year so I just started to photocopy those works um, oh sorry I should screen share right now okay hopefully that's working right now so anyway I came back to, to Australia and I was stuck, as I said, and I just didn't know what to do. So I just started to photocopy the images that somehow had haunted me throughout my travels. And they happened to be these kinds of images of um, old masters. 
when I was doing them, this one is called Event Without Moment, and it was actually the first photocopy that I ever did. And what's interesting about photocopy technology, it's very different to what it is today because um, previously these, these photocopies were, were made by layered carbon that was heat fused onto paper. So often the, the carbon, the, the photocopy was sooty. And that was kind of a beautiful material to work with. This next one is called um, The Silence of Painters. And you'll notice, and this is based on a Rembrandt, um, I think it's Rembrandt's wife, Saskia. Um, and there's also this, this gesture, which I want, which I will return to over and over again. But when I was doing these works, it wasn't so much that I was trying to be a clever postmodernist. It was more that I was actually trying to look at these faces and see if it, if it measured in or connected any way with my own face, you know, Europe and Chinese. I was trying to figure out the distance between um, my ancestry and my place of birth. But I was also repressing uh, the fact that I was Chinese because you have to understand that when I was born, the white Australia policy was very much to the foreground of, um, of national policy. So that, and it was especially a policy designed to prevent Chinese from coming to Australia. And the other astounding thing is, is that, you know, I was 21 when that policy was dismantled. So it's, it's a, you know, it's still new in our psyche. And I just need to remind people that uh, racism is still part of our culture. Anyway, so then I also started to paint. Uh, this painting is called Virtue, Moral Order and the uh, Discretion of Human Gesture. This painting is really significant to me because it's based on a work from an artist called Artemisia Gentileschi. And, you know, you, this may sound strange, especially to the young women in this um, forum. But when I was going, when I was thinking about going to art school, I was actually told that, you know, women couldn't be painters. And it's something that I was very angry about, but some part of me believed that. But when I went to Italy and I saw this painting and then I realised that the artist was in fact a woman and it was one of the most powerful paintings that I'd ever seen and somehow that's burned into my psyche and from that moment, because I, I read that label and it said Artemisia Gentileschi and she was a woman, I thought, you know what, maybe I could do this too. So that's when I, at this moment, applied to go to Chelsea School of Art and got accepted and thus the long, long road to becoming an artist. Now, um, while I was, you know, busily uh, establishing a reputation and get, making work to do with um, the copy and authenticity and, and things like that, um, there's also a part of me that I was really pushing down and that was my Chineseness, <clears throat> because one of the things that happens when, um, if you're a person of color or you're different because of gender or sexuality, you, you tend to internalize all the prejudice that's, that's, that's cultural, that's, that's around you. you. You might not agree with it, but somehow it affects you. You begin to sort of internalize and part of you believes um, the propaganda about the wrong things about what you are. Anyway, um, there was a conference at Sydney College of the Arts and it was about um, Asia and Australia and I was invited to speak and I kept thinking I have nothing to contribute because all my education is Western. Uh, I've never lived in China, all those sorts of stuff. And, you know, <clears throat> why are they asking me? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but anyway, I got onto the stage and I started to speak and I said, basically, you know, all of my work up until this point um, is carving out my lineage as being Western. I'm declaring with this work that I belong to the West. And you know, the, first, the moment those words came out of my mouth, I realized that in fact, anybody who belongs doesn't have to declare it. And I'd better look more deeply. So I was, I guess, protesting too much. And that again was another pivotal moment. Then started me turning towards trying to understand my, my relationship with my Chinese ancestry. 
And uh, this is one of the first experiments that I made um, using flung ink, which I'm gonna come back to later. But this, is, this splash has been a constant motif for at least 30 years, I would say, um, and it keeps going on. The other motif um, that I turned to in my, um, at this point was my family photograph album. So I started to use these images rather than European imagery. And here are some examples of um, the painting and the splash. So the painting on the left-hand side is one of my grandmother and it's called um, Virtues of the Receptive. The painting on the right hand side is an abstract painting um, and it's called Zip Zero Zilch. And these are made, I guess, in the 90s. This is a photographic work or um, based in photograph photography anyway. And this is a kind of personal favorite of mine, I guess. Um, if you look at the photograph, it's a, a triptych and there are a number of people in it. There's my father uh, holding my older brother's uh, hand, uh, my mother who happens to be six months pregnant at that time and her little sister. What we don't know in the narrative of this photo is that my dad is about to step on the boat to take him to Australia in a couple of hours time. And my mother and father are not to know when they will ever see each other again. And every time I look at this photograph, my heart absolutely breaks for my mum because uh, she's pregnant, six months pregnant. It's the end of the Second World War. China has, and the Chinese Revolution has just started. So basically my mother is left alone with her family to deal with it. And my dad can't bring her to Australia uh, because of white Australia policy. A Chinese man could not bring his family. It was just one person. Um, so it was probably about eight years before they met each other again when dad finally found the, the ways um, and the means to get mum to Australia. So this photo and this um, is very special to me uh, and it's called the seamless tomb. tomb. Okay, here's another family work um, and this one is called Birth and Death. And this is really special to me as well. So it's a made up of um, about a hundred accordion books and uh, the photographs are basically every member of my family from the first person, first of my family who, to come to Australia that we know of, and that would be my grandfather, um, to the youngest member who in this photograph is on the bottom right hand side. Uh, her name is Phoebe and she's half Chinese and half Greek. But anyway, I made this work, Birth and Death, to honour my nephew, Ben, uh, who very sadly died of cancer when he was quite young, when he was about 20. And I just wanted to create a work which gave him his sense of place um, in the lineage of our family and to honour him. And also the transitions that my family has taken to and from Australia, you know, and it's taken over five generations. It's a bit of a long story, you know, but it's taken five generations for the family to actually arrive and settle in Australia because of white Australia policy. This work is called No Up, No Down, I Am the 10,000 Things. And this was made originally, I guess, in about 1995 or something like that. And it, originally it was for um, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, but in the midst of time, it got destroyed. And I recreated it for the MCA show. I guess this, this work is important to me because it's the first time I publicly kind of deliberately invoked uh, any Zen philosophy in the work. So the no up, no down, I am the 10,000 things is, is derived a little bit, excuse me, from um, Dogen, who was a Japanese Zen philosopher. And he wrote that to study the self is to forget the self and be authenticated by the 10,000 things. And by that, I think what he means is, is that if you really want to know what you are and who you are, 
forget the constructions, you know, the things that say, I am good at this, I am bad at this, I am crap, I'm this, I'm, you know, all your attitudes and opinions are just constructions. Your authenticity actually comes from the way you meet your life genuinely and intimately. So rather than looking at the definitions that try to, to shore up ideas of what you are, actually engage with life, meet life, and in the, the intimate meeting with your existence, that's where you find your authenticity. And that's been a very, Dogen is a very important philosopher to me. Um, and anyway, so I made this work. All right. So one of the great things about being an artist is sometimes you get to play in some fabulous places. So uh, if you recall, I said, you know, the, the splash is a motif for me that's been very important through, for a long, long time, for decades. Um, and it, it's derived from a very ancient Chinese practice called flung ink painting. And what happens is that you meditate for a short time to sort of smooth over the mind chatter that goes on. You take up a flask of ink and then you just toss the ink, you know, and so that it spills onto paper. And it is absolutely understood that that mark was created by everything in the universe in that moment. All things have to exist in order for anything to come into existence. And some people um, have asked, um, you know, what Moon and a Dew Drop, which is the title to uh, my MCA show was. And it, it, it also comes from Dogen. So he's invoking the moon as, as something to stand in for infinity and cosmos. Um, and he's invoking a dew drop because a dew drop is the most ephemeral of all phenomena. You know, it burns off with the morning light and it's so tiny. Yet the, a dew drop can reflect the moon. And yet, and this is what I find really poetic and beautiful. Nonetheless, it has taken the totality of everything in the universe to come together in order to make that dew drop. And that dew drop also stands in for us, you and me, and everything in existence. So I did a lot of this splash painting, flung ink painting. And then um, I know I went to a foundry with a friend of mine and I saw bronze dripping. And I thought, that's what I want to do. It was so exciting, but it's very dangerous. Anyway, it's a long story. I eventually found a foundry that would help me to do this. And that's me pouring bronze. And this is the result of the bronze pour. So sometimes I pour into sand, which gives it more sculptural sort of volumetric forms. And sometimes they're just flat. When they cool down, they just become this cruddy color. But once you've polished them, they become quite golden. Um, this is one of the works, um, a flung bronze work called Buddhas and Matriarchs. Uh, it's about three meters in diameter. Uh, and this was at the MCA show. But you can see how individual each splash is. You know, you have to let go of, um, of any sense of control and just go with the moment, go, go be with the moment and be absolutely open to whatever occurs. And that's actually a principle of my practice. Here's another one called Strange uh, Condensations. This one is about seven meters by about one meter. And I love the fact that, you know, the shininess actually literally spills on, you know, the goldenness of the floor. So, you know, these works not only activate the wall, but they kind of activate the entire space. Okay, this one is called um, Open as the Sky. And this represents a departure as well. So this work is about 1.8 meters high and about two meters in diameter. Um, when I was pouring some bronze um, uh, one day, and I was always thinking that I really wanted to make um, a three-dimensional, a, a properly sculptural form. So I had this great idea and I went to Kev, the foundryman, and I said, Kev, what if we, you know, what if we drop molten bronze into water? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, maybe it would sort of form these amazing shapes. Anyway, 
Kevin just absolutely screamed at me and he said, no, you'll kill the suburb. Because of course, you know, bronze is 1200 degrees uh, Celsius. And if you drop that amount of heat into cold water, it will just cause an explosion. Um, so that was out of the question. But what I did think then, because don't ever give up, was that maybe lead could work. So I, end, so I asked Kev, what if we, uh, if we melt lead? Lead has a very low melting point. Um, and if we pour that into water, see what happens. Anyway, we did that. The first experiment didn't work because the, he the lead is so heavy that it just drops immediately to the bottom and just creates a string. I wanted more volume. I wanted sort of more bulbous forms. I wanted something much more interesting than that. So anyway, I had this great idea to use custard. So I went across to the corner shop and I bought um, a liter of Paul's custard. And so we started to dribble lead into the custard and the custard formed these shapes because the lead was, you know, rolling around in the custard, not going straight to the bottom. And so I would select certain shapes, which I would think would translate into much larger uh, work. Uh, and, and this is one of them. And I, um, I wish I had more photographs of it, but you could see it, it's, it's very golden. And the way in which it, it sort of, the reflections reflect in on themselves um, is quite beautiful, I think. Okay, this is another vein of my work. Um, so about 10, 10, 12 years ago, you know, artists really need to go into residency at times because, um, because you just need to be by yourself and you just, in order, you know, it just takes a long time to land whatever creative thought bubble you're having. So I decided to go to China and for, for some reason, all I wanted to do was just burn things. You know, there's, there's so much to talk about in in materiality and meaning. Um, usually when you choose, as an artist, when you choose to do something in a particular fashion, it's not just because, you know, you paint because you want to be a painter or something like that. I mean, there's a bit of that, but it's more that the material itself has meaning. Merleau-Ponty, um, French philosopher, he sort of once wrote something like, we only know the color red, um, because we've experienced the red of the sunset, the red of your blood, the red of the red flag of China, the red of the rose over there, you know. So all color and materials are by extension already have meaning in them because of our experience with them as we're moving through the world. So fire is one of those things and, um, and fire and water have become very, very important to me. And, and, Anyway, I'll talk more about that. So anyway, I buried myself in Beijing for about three months and just started to, to make fire drawings. And these are some examples. And that's me in my studio. Uh, and that's probably work that I did towards the end of last year, early this year. I've just finished a show at Sullivan and Stromford Gallery in Sydney, and that's some of the work. But all of this work is perforated with, um, with soldering irons. Um, and flame and then left out into the rain for the rain to do her business. And I think she's actually quite a good artist, this rain. See, these are some details of some of the work that I've been doing. Um, I, I find this amazing. So this is just the rain. Um, so the perforations were random, um, but you know, the rain and the ink find their own passage through this maze and create such incredibly intricate forms. Um, this, this, these are works that um, are called conflagrations at the end of time. Um, these are actually five meters long. I wish I had somebody standing in front of them because then you'd actually be able to see the scale. I sort of pop this in because as important as the actual physical form, you know, the paper or the metal that I work with is important. Just as important is the shadow life. 
So the left-hand photograph is this wonderful photo that a friend took because the, the light in my studio was glancing in at such an angle that it was creating these, um, these miniature rainbows. That evolved into, um, into work uh, by cutting into metal. So, and there's another long story in this too, but I, I began my association with a company called Urban Art Projects, UAP, and they, uh, they're an Australian company, but they um, make the fabricators of artworks all around the world. And their foundry in New York, for instance, um, has made the work of Louise Bourgeois, Jeff Koons, um, um, and they even make the Oscar. Anyway, so, I'm just, I'm just saying that I was very fortunate that um, I was able to, to form um, not just a, a fabricator artist relationship with UAP, but they really invited me in to play. So my, there's their various workshops around the world. They actually invite me in just to muck around. And that custard incident, incident by the way, actually happened at UAP, just Lindy playing. So I've just been so lucky. So it was, um Matt Tobin who was one of the is one of the directors of UAP he suggested after seeing my fire uh, drawings that I should do it in metal and this is the result which then becomes something like Moonlight Deities which is a very large installation uh, at the MCA show which finished um, uh, only a few weeks ago this is um all made out of paper would you believe the room is about 12 meters by about eight meters, I think. Uh, these are all made in my very small studio. Um, and I wanted to give the sense of um, silvery moonlight and the passage of time and the experience of, you know, slowing down and just being with a work, sort of feel the passage of time. Um, you know, it's an immersive work. So it's not a stretch to then understand how, <laughs> how I've started to make these very large sculptures. Um, this one is called The Life of Stars. Uh, it's six metres tall uh, to give it some better context. That's, that's two storeys high. It's made out of stainless steel, mirror polished and perforated with probably up to 100,000 holes, which are hand-placed. Uh, this is um, the tenderness of rain. Um, it won an award in, in Guangzhou um, in China. Uh, this one, these are just installations. Uh, unfortunately, I, this is in Xi'an. This is called Heaven and Earth. Uh, this is just to work, just to show you how I start off. So I just start doing these working drawings of, of shapes that I want and what, how I, I want them to feel. So I actually draw the feeling life of the sculpture before I actually settle on the exact form. This became this, which uh, is still outside the MCA. One of the beautiful things about stainless steel sculpture is that when it's mirror polished, it just, just sort of absorbs the imagery of the world during the day. Um, and when, and at night, when it's perforated like this, it kind of returns energy to the world. So it absorbs and return. And you could actually say that absorption and return is a kind of principle in my work as well. And this is the last shot. Uh, I also have a studio team who helped me to work because working on these very large projects I now work on requires a team. And while we're waiting around for the next big project, we've started to work on wood. Uh, so this is a tree that um, was lying in the timber yard, a eucalypt for about 30 years until I found it. And we, we're, we're just making these sculptures. Anyway, that's it for me. Um, Thanks. Thanks yeah, so much, Lindsay. Okay. It's incredibly generous. Um, and I just remind people that the Q&A facility is open for questions. If you have questions, please post them in there. Um, I wanted to start uh, start the questions with, a, with one that um, 
came up for me during the talk, Lindy, and that is, um, you know, the, the later works, well, not the later works, but certainly some of the bigger works, uh, stainless steel and bronze, which, uh, you know, very durable materials. And then the early part of your career is with photocopies. And I'm just wondering if the notion of permanence and impermanence is uh, part of your practice and if you could comment on that a little bit. <laughs> Uh, of course it is, David. Per impermanence is the first principle of the universe, you know. That means just everything changes. So, and it's the first principle in Buddhism. It's the only belief in Buddhism. That's just full stop. Things change. That's it. Um, so deal with it. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm being a bit blunt. It's not quite yeah, as blunt. blunt. But, um, but the... You know, like in the, in the large works, for instance, they're really solid forms, okay? And I love the fact that there's a kind of paradox that goes on. In this family of works, which I'll call the life of stars, the forms are very geometric, very solid, very stable. But the perforations dematerialise them. Mm. So there's this tension between coming in to uh, being and then sort of, dissolution the fire stones which are those you know custard splashes they're almost the opposite they are coming out of nothingness and coming into form I don't know if that makes any sense so I think at at from the very beginning if not impermanence that I was uh, grappling with I was grappling with materiality and the meanings the possible meanings of materials and somewhere along the line the sense of impermanence um, and the and the dualities between matter and the immaterial, all those sorts of things begin to mat begin to really make become important to me. Um, and time becomes important to me. Notions of time, experiences of time, and another name for impermanence is time. Right. Thanks. Um, a question that's just come through, um, could you please say something about the symbiotic nature of your Taoist and Buddhist practice and your art practice? How do they feed into each other? Uh, intimately. <laughs> um, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I would say that on one level, a lot of the work that I'm doing now uh, is based very deeply in meditation experiences. So in meditation, if you go into, um, there are some, some times when the mind chatter has settled so much and you begin to realise that the boundaries of self don't end with your skin. And that's a meditation experience that, you know, what flows in and flows out of you to construct self um, doesn't actually have these boundaries. Um, so, so that's something that I play with all the time. And that's that sense of dissolution and solid form that I was talking about in those sculptures. Um, also in, in Zen, there are these very wonderful stories called koans, which are uh, irresolvable stories in your intellect. And a lot of those stories form the axis around a lot of investigations. Um, one of my favourite koans, just as a simple one, is the seamless tomb. And you're to imagine yourself absolutely trapped in this tomb. It's only about your size and it is so tightly sealed that not one skerrick of light will get in. So if, if it's, and we are always, we will all find ourselves in that situation at some point. You know, we're emotionally crushed or, something has happened and we just can't move from this place. So the question is, in a koan always has a question. So if Zen is the science of freedom, or where, well, where is your freedom? How do you become free when you're trapped like that? And so these are the sorts of questions that you, you need to ponder. And my res one response, it's not actually the, the correct response, is that you, if you, um, in, if you're in that tomb, you, eventually your eyes become accustomed to the dark 
and just by the sensations of the feelings that you you know just the skin feelings that you might have you begin to realize that you're connected to a much bigger reality than just the one that you're contained in i don't know whether i'm making any sense but these react this this then as you're looking around this seamless tomb it actually by virtue of interconnection this tomb is vast it actually stretches to the edges of the universe so as long as one remembers the sense of connection that we actually live in, that tomb can be huge rather than uh, suffocating. Anyway, again, I always feel, don't get me started. There is so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> but it's just, it's all these things. But it's, and really it's the Zen, art practice comes under the umbrella of Zen practice. So the art becomes an expression of the, um, the inquiry um that my zen um studies um mm. yeah it's sort of the other yeah great um you, the, the next question is lindy do you feel that you happily hit a sweet spot in australia for your work to be respected and valued and is that open door still there for all artists so i guess the I think question after a lot please. go on no, I, was, I, I mean, it's, I think you touched upon this in your talk a little bit because it's, uh, you talked about the opportunities, your, your cultural background and the opportunities, you know, what people consider an artist, an Australian artist looks like or what Australian art looks like. And I guess this question's asking for a commentary about that, given that your career uh, is sustained, your practice has been sustained over, what, four or five decades now. Mm. Okay, when I started, A, there were no women artists. I mean, Betty Church was my art history teacher, so that was wonderful. Uh, but she wasn't an artist, I mean, you know. So things have changed. So what I want to say is that really importantly, you know, I think I've, my lifetime, people my age have witnessed the transition of Australia from a monoculture, you know, sort of, with you know mother england as its backbone you know we've be, we've grown from monoculture and to understand that the reality of australia is multicultural so there's still a lot of uh pushback about that as you know we can name certain politicians and but let's not go there um but the reality of australia is it's that it's is its diversity so i was a founding member and uh, former president of 4a which is the asian australian artist association gallery 4a those of you who know it and we you know when it started we needed um i remember it was pauline hansen who was who just come you know she was stirring up a whole lot of racism against chinese um in the 90s i think it would have been late 90s and people like us and john young um just said how is this happening still? So we got together and we established um, because, you know, the belief, our belief continues to be um, Asian Australians or non-white Australians aren't periphery. We're actually at the centre where we are absolutely intrinsic to this culture. So in my long-winded way, I think it's been a battle to break down the, the white male stereotypes about what an artist is but those stereotypes have been broken down um, and I think that the more opportunities that are created for artists who are of difference but everybody has difference do you know what I mean um, um, anyway so the more Okay, so I have hit a sweet spot. I don't know how long that sweet spot is going to last, but it's been a bloody long time to get there. And we have to be careful to make sure that sweet spot actually grows for more people. Because I'm only, my success is only possible because now Australia has grown sufficiently to understand that the true nature of Australian culture is its diversity. And we have to keep building that and demonstrating that. So the work's not done, but there's a crack open in the door. Lindy, we're gonna leave it there. I just can't thank you enough for your generosity in taking us through 
um, so many aspects of your career and, you know, really congratulations on not just the show uh, at the MCA, but um, uh, congratulations for your practice and, and the, the many um, forms that that's taken, but also how deeply related they are all the way from the, from the 80s right through to now. Thank you again. Um, <laughs> Thanks, David. It's for, been lovely to talk to you. Yeah. And, and for our audiences, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to welcoming you to um, next week's session. Our artist next week will be Hayley Miller-Baker and um, we'll see you at 12.30 next Thursday. Thanks again, Lindy, and goodbye, everyone.